Oh, son of a bitch, bitch, uh, son of a bitch, bitch, son of a bitch, 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 uh, gun. <laughs> Porky Pig is a cute, innocent and affable pig, commonly considered the Looney Tunes' first breakthrough star. He is the second most featured Warner Brothers character behind only Bugs Bunny, having appeared in close to 160 classic shorts, three of which are included in the renowned list of 50 greatest cartoons as voted by a thousand animation professionals. After going through various evolutions and with a changing audience taste, Porky would later be demoted to a side character along alongside such Looney Tunes as Daffy Duck and Sylvester the Cat, ending his career as one of the most underutilised Warner Brothers cartoon characters of the late 20th century and modern era. In 2019, Porky Pig turns 84 years old, and to celebrate I will trace his entire evolution right from 1935 to now. To do so, we will look at the most drastic and important changes in his design and personality, prevalent across more than eight decades of shorts and series, in this edition of Cartoon Evolution. <laughs> In 1928, Walt Disney introduced the world to Mickey Mouse, a mischievous yet lovable cartoon who rapidly took the world by storm. Of course, animation had existed before Walt Disney and there had been various popular cartoons prior to Mickey, but it was the innovative nature of Disney's cartoons, the very first to sync sound and music with animation, that gripped audiences like none before. As an independent production house, Disney quite rightly became the envy of every major Hollywood studio Studio, many of which began to put greater efforts into their animated shorts to rival them. Others, without any animated output of their own, such as the somewhat newly founded Warner Brothers, were likewise inspired to get into the lucrative cartoon game. As a matter of circumstance, it was Warner's 1927 film The Jazz Singer starring Al Jolson, which had pioneered synchronised sound in cinema as the first talking picture and had inspired Disney to add sound to his Mickey Mouse shorts in the first place. Warners had been looking for a way to promote their recently acquired enormous music library and they believed cartoons to be the answer. Producer and businessman Leon Schlesinger, who some believe may have helped finance the jazz singer, was the man given the contract to produce a cartoon series for them. Schlesinger had recently seen an innovative test cartoon titled Bosco the Talk Inc. Kid, the first animation to be synchronised with dialogue. It starred African American character Bosco, who as it happened had also been inspired by Al Jolson's blackface routine in The Jazz Singer. The short was produced independently by two ex-Disney animators, Hugh Harmon and Rudolph Ising, and was similar in style to Disney's early Alice comedies which they had both worked on. Impressed with the short and character, Schlesinger contracted them to create his series for Warners. In a parody of Disney's Silly Symphony short series, the series was titled Looney Tunes, and the first short, Sinkin' in the Bathtub, was released in 1930. While the Bosco shorts are often disdained for their weak or non-existent storylines, it was the dialogue and music that stood them apart from Disney's, and thus made them a hit with audiences. Bosco became Warner's and the Looney Tunes first recurring cartoon star. However, in 1933, after a total of 39 musical cartoons, Harmon and Ising's relationship with Schlesinger soured over budgetary disputes. Not being allowed the same kind of budgets as Disney's cartoons, the two producers broke free of their contract, and having smartly registered copyright on him years before signing the studio deal, took Bosco with them to MGM. Without his star character, Schlesinger needed to develop a new one to stay afloat, and believing it to be the only way he could continue to compete with Disney, hired no less than five of his ex-employees to head production. Assigned to develop a new character, animators Tom Palmer and Earl Duval created Buddy, a character who has been described as Bosco in a white face. Unfortunately, while Buddy was the second headliner of the Looney Tunes, he didn't manage to capture the audience as Bosco had, with many finding him to be bland. Animation historian Michael Barrier would even refer to his shorts as desperately unfunny. Animators were tasked to redesign Buddy multiple times, with Freeze Freeling and Ben Hardaway each taking a shot. In a last ditch effort to win over or perhaps deceive the audience, Hardaway's version was an undeniable imitation of Bosco. As put by animator Robert Clampett, after five years of Looney Tunes, Leon still didn't have one well-known cartoon character and it was becoming a bit of a crisis. 
Schlesinger, hoping to spawn one or two standout characters by appealing to popular interests, cunningly devised a plan to have his animators concoct an animal version of Hal Roach's then highly successful Our Gang serial, perhaps better known today as The Little Rascals, which followed a group of poor neighbourhood children's adventures. The resulting short was 1935's I Haven't Got a Hat, which introduced a plethora of rascally children characters taking part in a school talent show. They were Beans the Cat, Little Kitty, Oliver Owl, Ham and X, and Porky Pig. For his freeling who directed the short and is commonly considered Porky's creator, would note in his autobiography that he had attended school with two brothers nicknamed Porky and Piggy, which inspired the name of the character. Clampett, however, claimed that he christened the character, noting that the names Ham and X immediately made him think of Pork and Beans, inspiring both Porky Pig and Beans the Cat in one clean swoop. Clampett's claim, however, should be taken with a grain of salt, considering that he has infamously been accused of being a shameless self-promoter by colleagues and an egotist who took credit for everything by voice artist Mel Blanc. Many animation historians have even questioned the validity of many of his personal claims. It's also worth noting that, likely coincidentally, a character named Porky debuted in the Our Gang shorts that same year. Porky debuts in the short as a fat and temperamental piglet, and while his design would change drastically in later shorts, his stutter was there from the very beginning. While it's been suggested that popular stuttering comedic actor Roscoe Eights inspired Porky's speech disorder, Freeling would note, I used the stuttering because I thought it would give him something different, some character. Actor Joe Doherty, who was a natural stutterer, was the original voice of Porky, though his recordings would be sped for comedic effect. When the short debuted to audiences, it was an enormous hit. Animator Robert McKimson, who claims to have animated Porky's first scene, despite not being credited, would note that audiences got the biggest wallop out of the stuttering pig, and so he decided to make a character out of him. Strangely, however, it wasn't Porky, but Beans, who was initially groomed to be the studio's next star and would become a minor success in Looney Tunes between 1935 and 1936, in which time he appeared in a further 10 shorts. To make his shorts more interesting and in an effort to bolster their roster of characters, animators would pair him with other characters from the Looney Hour Gang in supporting or cameo roles. 1936's Gold Diggers of 49, for example, the first cartoon directed by Schlesinger's latest acquisition, the soon-to-be legendary Tex Avery, would feature many members of the gang. Here, Avery used Porky as a supporting character and made him an enormously fat adult and strangely the father of Little Kitty. Following Gold Diggers, Porky would be paired with Beans in a number of shorts, over which time he would change from child to adult, depending on who was animating at the time. One thing that did remain consistent, however, was the laughs, with filmmakers realising that Porky was evoking bigger ones than Beans. Smart as they were, they set in motion a plan to not only demote Beans to a side character, but to phase him out of the Looney Tunes altogether. 1936's Westwood Woe would mark Porky's final appearance next to Beans and Beans' final appearance in a cartoon ever. And in that year, Porky would appear in his first solo cartoon, The Blowout, and his first marquee headliner, Plain Dippy, both of which continued to depict him in different designs. The Blowout would see him as an innocent child hell-bent on buying an ice cream and a soda, while Plain Dippy would depict him as a bumbling adult looking to join the war effort. In fact, this constantly changing design almost became a strange tradition. While Walt Disney was a stickler for consistency in design, rarely devolving his characters, the Schlesinger team was a little more erratic, with many rebellious artists refusing to conform to any one style. However, audiences of the time obviously didn't care. It gave the Warners cartoons that certain edge which made them so distinct and popular, and over the next two years, audiences devoured a further 43 Porky shorts. He would debut in Looney Tunes title cards in 1936's Little Bo Porky, and in closing titles with 1937's Rover's Rival, where for the first time he would be seen bursting through a drum and uttering his now famous catchphrase. That's all, folks. While this is a line synonymous with Porky, it had been used previously by Bosco, Buddy, and Beans. 
Over this period, Porky's design remained in a state of flux, with studio directors Avery, Frank Tashlin, Jack King, Cal Howard, Cal Dalton, Ben Hardaway and even Ub Iwerks, the co-creator of Mickey Mouse, all putting their own spins on the character. What's interesting to note is the folded dog-like ears Avery would use in a number of his cartoons. However, it was Clampett's spin on Porky, starting with 1937's Bad Time Story, that would define the character well into the future. Under his supervision, Porky was made less tubby with a much smaller waist. He was given a large, round head with big, emotive eyes. He thus became a lot cuter than before. He would also be depicted as a young adult with a smarter personality. Clampett would also infuse Porky with a grandiose sense of adventure and a wacky comedic style. Best displayed in 1938's Porky in Wacky Land, a short which, alongside the screwball Avery shorts of the time, had a large influence on the ongoing style of the Looney Tunes cartoons and is often considered one of the greatest cartoons of all time. No matter how wacky or crowd-pleasing Porky had become at the height of his stardom, 1937 short Porky's Duck Hunt, directed by Avery, introduced a surprise new star, a zany little black duck who was the target of Porky in one of his few antagonistic portrayals. Daffy, as he would go on to be known, was a madcap character unlike any scene before and would be the first to truly steal the scene from Porky. But in the interim, Porky's evolution continued, as prolific voice artist Mel Blanc took over the role from Doherty, whose real life stutter was becoming a bit of a problem, slowing recording sessions and making them vastly more expensive. Blank retained Porky's stutter, which had become synonymous with the character, though he did soften it a touch. He also used the stutter more effectively and comedically, developing a recurring gag where Porky would struggle with simple words but could substitute them with more complex ones without problem. This is the Porky Pig bringing you the latest news of the week, week, uh, latest news of the week, 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 week in the past seven days. While Porky continued to be highly popular, appearing in 25 shorts throughout 1938 and 1939, his star was beginning to wane, as Daffy Duck began an incredibly rapid rise to the top. While the vast majority of Porky's shorts from this period were solo adventures, he would be paired up with or face off against Daffy in a number of them as well, being completely outshone in each one. So much so that by the end of 1938 with The Daffy Dog, Porky would be appearing in Daffy cartoons, playing second fiddle to the only months old character. At last, in 1939, all of the studio's animators conformed with Clampett's Porky design, finally bringing a uniformity to the Porky shorts. This new standard design would even begin appearing in the Looney Tunes title cards. That same year's Old Glory would be the first Porky solo short to be produced in colour, with Jones emulating a Disney-esque style. Despite the short's Technicolor production, the vast majority of Porky's 44 appearances between 1939 and 1943 would still be produced in black and white. Despite there being far fewer Daffy shorts, they were continuing to outshine Porky's in every single way. Daffy's were wackier, funnier and more enjoyable. He represented a new breed of cartoon character, while Porky represented those of the past. In 1940s animation live-action hybrid You Ought To Be In Pictures, Freeling, who hadn't directed a Porky short since Haven't Got A Hat, devised a highly meta parody of the situation, in which Daffy, wanting to hustle his way into a starring contract at the studio, convinces Porky to quit his. Thus began a friendly rivalry between not only the two short series, but the characters as well. In fact, the following year would be the last to see a major output of Porky Shorts with the release of 13. In 1942, the studio only put out a third of the amount with five shorts. Daffy's series, on the other hand, flourished. In comparison, only two Daffy's were released in 1941, but five the same amount as Porky in 1942. Late that year, Daffy would even begin appearing in the Looney Tunes title cards alongside Porky before later appearing on his own. From this point on, Daffy would appear in more shorts than Porky almost annually, with the number of Porky shorts continually dwindling. It is worth noting that Schlesinger sold his studio and its assets to Warner's outright in 1944, which substantially lessened film production overall. It's further worth noting that Daffy's peak stardom would be short-lived when Bugs Bunny arrived on the block and snatched it away a few years later. 
Regardless, Porky would still appear in many of his own shorts, but would appear more regularly as a supporting character in Daffy's. Audiences had well and truly moved away from Porky, but the animators had a deep admiration for the character and kept him around for sentimentality. Seeing as though he was no longer getting the laughs that he once had, animators ingeniously used him as the straight man in many of his appearances, creating comedy gold as he'd play off characters such as Daffy, Sylvester the Cat and Charlie Dog, the latter two of which he appeared in numerous shorts with across the late 1940s and early 1950s. In the 1950s, in fact, Chuck Jones, who was handling the vast majority of Porky's appearances, used the Porky Daffy straight man funny man formula in a series of highly popular and much beloved team up shorts, many of which parodied famous films and serials of the era. These would include such classics as Drip Along Daffy, Robin Hood Daffy, and Duck Dodgers in the 24 and a half century. By the 1950s, Porky was almost exclusively starring in Daffy shorts, with his final solo cartoon, The Wearing of the Grin, released in 1951. In the early 1960s, however, the golden age of animation as a whole was coming to an end, as audiences turned their back on cinemas in favour of television, which was a cheaper and much more convenient entertainment experience. As a result, Warner Brothers Animation shut doors in 1964, and the final classic Warner short to feature Porky, Dumb Patrol, was released. This was the first Porky short for three years, and he only appeared in a cameo. The Looney Tunes series did, however, continue for a further three years in poorly drawn and written low budget shorts produced by an outsourced animation studio co-owned by Freeling. Most of these shorts were directed by McKimson and while there were a total of 39, Porky would only appear in two. 1965's Corn on the Cop, which was the final Golden Age short to feature original Porky animation, and 1966's Mucho Locos, which featured archive animation. While the Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies series continued until 1969, Walt Disney had mostly left cartoons behind in the 1950s in an effort to focus on television. And as the continuing leader of the entertainment industry, not only audiences but other studios followed in his trail. Amongst them was Hanna-Barbera, who became the first studio to produce cartoons exclusively for the medium, as well as find success in airing their classic theatrical shorts. Warners took their model and debuted The Bugs Bunny Show in 1960, a series which likewise repurposed classic theatrical shorts with brand new wraparound animation featuring Bugs and Daffy. This series was so successful that Warners premiered a second package series in 1964, The Porky Pig Show, which featured Porky in wraparounds as he invited the audience into his barn to watch a selection of classic shorts, ones that would differ from those presented on Bugs Bunny Show. While Bugs Bunny Show aired in various incarnations for 40 years, Porky Pig Show only ran for less than three, with syndicated repeats airing between 1971 and 1990 under the title Porky Pig and Friends. These package series proved so successful for Warners that they gave Bugs and Daffy numerous television specials and theatrical films, all of which used the same package format across the 1970s and 1980s. Porky would appear in dozens of them, but in the vast majority only in archive shorts. He would, however, briefly team up with Bugs in 1978's newly animated television special A Connecticut Rabbit in King Arthur's Court, later renamed Bugs Bunny in King Arthur's Court, where he would portray Vartlet, Sir Loin of Pork. While he had appeared alongside Bugs in numerous cameos, this would be the first time Porky would appear substantially alongside him, not counting 1938's Porky's Hair Hunt, which debuted a Bugs prototype. He would then appear in 1979 television special Bugs Bunny's Looney Christmas Tales, where he would take on the role of Bob Cratchit in a parody of Dickens' Christmas Carol. Additionally, he would make appearances in 1980's The Bugs Bunny Mystery Special, formed in the style of a Hitchcockian whodunit murder mystery, as well as in Daffy Duck's Thanks for Giving Special, where he would be teamed up with Daffy for the first time in almost two decades in the Duck Dodgers and the Return of the 24 and a half century short. He would also appear in two 1980s specials, Daffy Duck's Quackbusters and Bugs vs Daffy Battle of the Music Video Stars, both of which featured Mel Blanc's final voice work as Porky and his various other characters before his death in 1989. 
Just prior to this, however, Blank had also lent his voice to Porky for his brief cameo in 1988 Disney movie Who Framed Roger Rabbit, for which Warners loaned out many of their characters. He would deliver the film's sign-off in his iconic way alongside Peter Pan's Tinkerbell. 1990's Gremlins 2 at the New Batch would also feature a newly animated Porky cameo where he was now voiced by Jeff Bergman. Throughout the 1990s, Porky would continue to be one of Warner's most underutilised characters, mainly appearing in small cameos. He would cameo in television series such as in two episodes of Animaniacs and in numerous episodes and specials of Tiny Toon Adventures, where he would appear as the mentor of Hampton J. Pig, a character who was designed as a childlike Porky. He would also be featured in 1991 television special Bugs Bunny's Overtures to Disaster as part of the original short Porky and Daffy in the William Tell Overture. The 90s also saw a resurgence of newly animated theatrical shorts, the first since the 1960s. Of these, Porky would appear in 1995's Carrot Blanca, a spoof of Warner's classic 1942 film Casablanca, and 1996's Superior Duck, another short film from the world of Duck Dodgers. Porky would take a supporting role in 1996 theatrical film Space Jam, a live action animation hybrid which saw the tunes teaming up with basketball superstar Michael Jordan to save the Earth against alien invaders. At first starstruck by Jordan, Porky would go on to play for the Toon Squad and even score during the film's final match. He would also deliver a variant of his famous sign-off. Here Porky would be drawn in his classic design but with realistic 3D shading effect to help him stand out against the live-action backdrop. The box office success of Space Jam led to belated 2003 follow-up Looney Tunes Back in Action, which would feature only two very small Porky cameos. While received moderately by critics, the movie was a financial flop and prevented Warners from releasing any more Looney Tunes adventures theatrically, including My Generation G -G Gap, the first solo Porky short since 1951. The short would be released but was delegated to a straight-to-home video exclusive. Throughout the 2000s and 2010s, Porky likewise has mostly starred intermittently on Looney Tunes themed TV series and specials. Though not part of the main roster, he would appear as a toddler version of himself in a handful of musical numbers in 2002's Baby Looney Tunes. And his villainous descendant Pinkster Pig would be one of the main antagonists in 2005 futuristic series Lunatics Unleashed. His most significant role during this period would be as a regular in 2003's Duck Dodgers series Series, where he would once again take on his role as the eager young space cadet, Duck Dodger's smart and loyal sidekick and protege. This series would mark Porky and Daffy's first significant and extended pairing for decades, once again depicting them in the classic straight man, funny man dynamic. Porky and Daffy would once again be squared off in 2006 straight to DVD feature Bar Humduck, another loony retelling of Dickens A Christmas Carol set in the modern day, which again plays Porky in the Bob Cratchit role. He would also very briefly appear in 2015 straight to DVD feature Rabbit's Run. Both films would feature slightly simplified animation designs due to their low budget and internationally outsourced animation. 2011 saw the release of The Looney Tunes Show, which featured Daffy and Bugs as suburban animals. Porky would appear occasionally in the series as their friend and fall guy, usually being suckered into their schemes. Here, Porky would be given a more angular design by artist Jessica Baranski, which incorporated elements of Clampett's and Jones's looks. Porky, however, would be drastically redesigned for 2015's new Looney Tunes, originally called Wabbit, where he would once again be depicted as the morbidly obese, hapless adult Porky of the early 1930s shorts, most often being shown as a partner to Bugs and a victim to Daffy's zany antics. In 2019, Warner Brothers will launch yet another follow-up series, simply titled Looney Tunes Cartoons, which will be heavily inspired by the Golden Age shorts. Each short will feature writing and animation by different cartoonists and storytellers, allowing different personalities and styles to come through. A clear return to the early days where artists had free reign and shorts and characters cycled through sporadic styles. While Porky hasn't featured in any promos yet, a short titled Pitcher Porky has been announced, and assuming Porky has multiple appearances throughout the series, it's likely we'll see multiple designs reflecting the changing nature throughout the Golden Age. Perhaps something similar to what's been featured in the opening titles of Warner's most recent animated films. And now it's over to you! I want to know what's your favourite Porky Pig design appearance and a short? Fire away in the comments below and let me know. With that... That's all, folks!
If this is your first time viewing one of my videos and you'd like to see more like it in the future, then please don't forget to hit that big old subscribe button up on your screen, as well as that like button down below for that little extra support. Also, don't forget to check me out on social media, and please consider supporting me over on Patreon. Thanks for watching, and have a fantastic day.